Um, not sure exactly what I'm going to talk about in this talk, so I'll give you a little bit of warning. I mean, I know what I'm going to talk about, but the interesting thing is that usually when I give these kinds of talks, it's to a group who has no idea what an REG is or why it matters. And that's clearly not this group. So I'm going to um, provide a brief introduction about myself and, and Cyleron, why it was founded. And then I'm going to talk pretty much about um, the types of sloppy experiments that Bob talked about. Because in a way, as I'll get to, um, the point of Cyleron is to kind of have a lot of people conducting a lot of sloppy experiments. Um, and we, we're trying to see how the effects work outside of the lab environment. And I think that we find a lot of correlations outside of the lab environment with structural data that's seen in the lab environment. So I'll kind of beat around that a little bit and uh, show some examples. And for anyone who's interested in conducting REG experiments, I think some of this information might be a little bit useful. But you can be the judge of that. So a quick introduction about myself. Um, I started working at the Paralab. Before I went to college, I was a high school student, and through a long series of events, I took off. Um, I decided not to go to college for a year, and I worked at the Pair for Pair Lab full time for one academic year and two summers. And it's hard for me to think back and remember this time in my life, but basically, now that I'm running Siloron, I'm constantly answering questions from people along the lines of, "Well, what happens if I run the REG faster? Or what happens if I have 20 REGs?" And you know, there's a whole list of these um, questions. And when I started at the Paralab, I kind of viewed the effect in that way. I thought of it as, I'll refer to it, you know, it's just as a causal mechanistic phenomena. The idea that there's some underlying mechanism, maybe it's physical, maybe it's not, but there's a mechanism that can be thought of as operating on a physical process. I don't really believe that anymore. Um, and a big part of that is because of my experience at the Paralab and what I found in the five or six years following that. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but basically, um, what, I, what I found was that we were conducting all these experiments at the lab that led to interesting bottom line results. But oftentimes, they involved hundreds of thousands of trials or millions of trials and lots of different operators. And one of the things I did at, while I was at the Paralab was I would come in on weekends or spend some time by myself and just run my own small experiments. I would say, you know, what happens if I come in on Saturday and I'm just going to do a few trials and uh, I'm going to test just arbitrary things. Um, what is the effect of my state of mind? You know, it's all very subjective. These are very sloppy experiments in a way. I did do some not sloppy experiments that uh, Bob has d helped put together into some written form. Um, and basically, in the sloppy experiments, what I was finding was that, you know what, over very small numbers of trials, I'm getting terminal levels of significance that are equivalent to what we find in these big experiments. I'm feeling subjective indications of uh, my state of mind or my way of being actually influencing what's happening with the device. And for people who come at it with the kinds of assumptions or ideas that I said I began with, which are that the REG phenomena is this sort of causal mechanistic, um, you know, there's a light beam coming out of my mind hitting the REG and, you know, it shifts three bits per 10,000, it would really seem to be um, contradictory to say that, well, we generated an experiment with six million trials and, uh, you know, We've got a z-score of three. Well, it would seem like a contradiction to say that this guy can walk into the room, sit down for a couple of hours, conduct a small, meaningful experiment, and come out with a z-score of three. It almost doesn't make any sense. So anyway, I was feeling like I didn't know if I wanted to go after this kind of research in a, from an, basically an academic perspective, because it seemed like our paradigm for evaluating these kinds of effects was just way too constrained. But at the same time, you know, it's having these experiences and being at the Paralab and kind of seeing how real the effects were, um, that made me feel like it was just really frustrating because it's like, well, I know there's something that's real. At least, you know, that's what I believe for my experiments. And it's going to be really hard to convince society of that in the regular academic way. So I wanted to do something with the field, but, you know, I didn't want to spend 40 more years conducting long experiments. So <laughs> what, what I did was um, start this thing called Siloron. And the, the basic goal of uh, Siloron, which I co-founded with a guy named Herb Mertz, who was uh, around at the Paralab back in the 70s, before I was born. Um, so we got together, and we, we started this thing called Siloron. Realistically speaking, we did not have much of a goal. Um, there was not a great business model. or you know, This was driven by an interest in the field and having seen a lot of things in the research myself. So the basic goal was, let's make it possible for other people con to conduct their own experiments. And I've already explained this, but my feeling was that um, first person, well, this is also an important side point, I guess. 
anybody can take the research and read it. And Bob and Brenda ha and Roger and all of the York and all of these people who've worked at the Parallab have said amazing things. But if all you do is you read that, you come to know it at a logical level, and you can say, well, over these two million trials, you know, there was this significant effect. But that doesn't tell anything about, um, you know, the how the effect evolved, or how it got there, or what was the actual experience that led to that effect. And what I'm going to claim is that the experience of getting there, or the subjective process involved, and everybody at Pear and other researchers in this field have talked about this already. I just want to make it a little bit more explicit. The subjective experience involved really may play a fundamental role in driving what kinds of effects you get. So I felt that there was a new need, and we needed a new way to conduct experiments, small experiments that are meaningful. We need to explore it a little bit more. So the idea with Sidearm is we're going to make REGs and we're going to get them out to people and see what happens. Also, I mean, obviously running an experimental program like Pair is expensive. You have to have REGs, staff, software analysis, et cetera. Well, because when I was at the Pair Lab, another big part of what I did was make hardware, write software, conduct analysis. I kind of covered a lot of the spectrum. I said, well, maybe we can kind of box what the lab did and make it easy for someone to just buy sort of a little prepackaged thing that they could hook up to their computer so they can explore this themselves. That's pretty much what we did. Um, so we, that was our first product. We call it the REG1. We sell a random event generator software analysis tools so that you can conduct your own experiments. Uh, we also, nowadays, that there are more people working with us, um, we will help people to conduct experiments, design protocols, analyze it, et cetera. Um, basically, we also, we're technically a for-profit company, so, but it's kind of weird. I mean, this was started out of um, an interest in the research, and we continue to pretty much conduct informal research experiments all the time. Uh, the thing here, though, is that our experimental paradigm is a little bit different than, let's say, the pair paradigm, because our goal is to create applications. We want to just find out how do these things work in the real world. Um, what can they do? What can't they do? Um, I don't really go out of my way to try to convince anyone that it's real. I think that's extremely important. We need to get the mainstream scientific paradigm on board in order to do this. Well, eventually, at least. Um, but we're, we look at our data a little bit differently. So that's where the sloppiness part comes in, too. I mean, I'm going to start bringing some stuff up here, which I could shoot down myself uh, fairly easily. But that's not the point. The point is, you'll start to see that there are uh, sort of anecdotal tendencies that emerge in the data that are very, very close, if not the exact same thing, to what we find in the controlled laboratory studies. So I'll get to that. Also, we th I say we throw some basic assumptions about science at the wind out the window. Uh, that does relate to. Uh, Basically, a little bit of the experimental method, um, we try to structure the experiments around the operators rather than try to make the operators do things around the experimental protocol. I mean, it's a thousand times easier to conduct experiments with fixed trial lengths. You know, every operator is going to do exactly this on this day and on and on. But as an operator myself, I feel like that's not the best way to get an effect. So we, we're trying to do the best that we can to uh, develop new ways to conduct experiments that are both rigorous but cater to the operators. So now I'm going to start blowing through this because I may not be doing so well on time. Um, we're coming out with other things, uh, little robots, for example. If you want to do your own robot experiment, give us a, send us an email in the next month or two, and we might have something for you. Um, we're also trying to help people learn how to better conduct these experiments, um, what the statistics are, what they can expect, et cetera. So we're creating some informational materials. Um, and a third part of what we're doing right now that's kind of important, at least for re as far as researchers are concerned, is that we're, we've always had sort of an online data collection effort. Anyone who is conducting experiments with our REGs can decide that they want to upload their data to us. And this allows for some interesting things because we can start to see um, which sorts of effects, well, in principle, we can start to see what sorts of effects um, are consistent, let's say, across laboratories or across experimenters, and which ones are maybe specific to a particular lab, a particular experimenter. Um, in the pair data, you know, there's some evidence that and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's evidence that during time periods of enthusiasm, excitement, et cetera, there might have been slightly better effects. And then you tell the operators, OK, it's time to replicate now. We don't believe you effectively, or something like that. And the results aren't as good. And that comes up all the time at Sileron, so I'll get into that. Um, all right, disclaimer, I'm just going to fly through this. I already said I'm talking about sloppy stuff. So not everything that I'm going to say is going to come from well-controlled studies, but I hope we can get around that uh, temporarily. And also, I don't feel bad about this, because kind of as Bob said, there is a lot of precedent for being able to conduct good experiments over short time spans with, under the least ideal circumstances. All right, so I'm going to rehash some pair ideas just to give everybody some background. Effects do not appear to be dependent on the underlying physical phenomena. Basically speaking, um, and again, you can't say this for sure, basically speaking, 
There's, at Paralab, you have the random mechanical cascade, the REGs, the robots. There are different types of REGs. They all seem to, at the end of the day, produce results with similar structure. Cyleron, we've tried different types of REGs. Since we are an REG company, we've dis used different physical processing methods. At the end of the day, we see similar things. Other background finding, Bob talked about the robot experiment. Operators can create effects on a short-term basis. Um, student projects tend to get good experiments, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip that. So some quick points, database size. I'm going to skip this as well because I guess I already talked about it a little bit. But I would suggest that if anyone is going to conduct experiments, that you conduct short, well-controlled experiments with a very clear, well-defined purpose. Meaning you don't need to sit around and generate you know, two million trials in order to come up with the, a, a conclusion saying that there was an effect. In fact, I think that may be counterproductive, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, series position effects. Bob John talked about this in the robot paper. You saw the first series of the second operator being very significant. You saw a second series that was inverted with a comparable effect size. Um, we find this um, sort of in the real world occurring at many, many levels within the experiment. Someone, they do their first series of the day, maybe the second one will be inverted. They do their second day of an experiment and there may be a tendency towards aversion, um, inversion. So, that's pretty important. Um, there are philosophical confounds related to this or philosophical issues to be aware of. A lot of times when you tell an operator, or in my experience, when an operator finds out that they've been doing really well, we will see an inversion shortly after. This occurs at almost all experimental levels. So I want to mention that and also that it's particularly relevant to same lab replications. Um, you can't, well, I'll get to that later. Um, bottom line significance, do not expect to find ever increasing, le increasing levels of statistical significance. Some experiments or operator data, databases seem to, they get to a level of significance and then they almost sit there forever. It's uh, kind of what Bob was talking about with the 0.05 effect. Um, and actually at Cyleron, I started by saying 0.05 isn't good enough. We need to see bigger effects. And actually, again, very anecdotal, it seems like that sort of hanging position, you know, where is the data going to get stopped is related to the particular experimenter or the operator. Now, I'm not saying that you can say, oh, well, my significance criteria is one in a billion, and that's going to all of a sudden give you great results. Um, but there's some interesting stuff there. And finally, purpose. Um, it's very important that you're generating data for a reason. We find that when people are, let's say, running an REG during a job interview or something, they say, hey, how is my residence with the interview? I have people who go dancing, and they run it when they go dancing. Um, all these different situations. We tend to see much larger effects that are much more relevant when people are doing it for that kind of purpose than when, for example, I, I say there's a graduate student slash slave slash employee problem. This is where you, you've arbitrarily decided that your experiment is going to be 500,000 trials long and you start, telling, you start cracking the whip and saying, guys, we need more data. Come on, go generate some data. So people go into the room and they start um, generating it, but you know, it just doesn't do anything. So anyway, a quick example, and I'm going to close with this example because I only have about a minute left. Um, so long story short, we had an operator who had generated 2,752,000 single-bit trials. The point is, their result is their overall database over the course of many months, we just took a snapshot at the time we were doing this, uh, was statistically significant, you know, like the z-score of about a 2.58, I think I, yeah, 2.58. Um, was marginally, was statistically significant, but it's two million some odd trials. So this person spent 96 hours or something generating this. And I'm having an argument with the operator kind of saying, he was saying, well, I can train, I can get better, we can get better results. And I was saying, I believe that you can train, et cetera, but I think that we're, we're going to get hit by this sort of arbitrary significance level issue where, you know, the significance level is 0.05, so you uh, get stuck at 0.05. And I said, for you, you're going to get stuck at, uh, Two points something. You know, this a lot. Most of the, I said most of the data that you've showed me anecdotally in real life has been, you know, Z's of 2.1 to 2.5-ish. You know, they're, they're almost always in the twos on a great day. You might get a three, but and it does seem like the person's doing it pretty much on demand, roughly speaking. But whatever. So he sends me an email, and it was funny. We were joking. Around. He said, "You'll pay for this." So <laughs> he sends me an email that says, "You'll pay for this," and then about a half hour later he sends me this, this result from our program. It's, it's going to be really hard for me to fly through it, but the bottom line point is that in 30 minutes, he generated an REG effect with the result of z-score of 2 over 30 minutes. So now he's got a, re a, a result with statistical significance that's almost comparable to his overall database, but um, he did it in 30 minutes. So he said, he said, you'll pay. He sent me this, and he was like, I showed you. And I was like, wait a second. No, you didn't. You're, you're just proving my point. Um, you got the same level of significance that you had in the overall database, et cetera. And so he went away for a little bit. And then he sends me another email a little while later with a screenshot attached. And it says, I hope you're happy. <laughs> and 
this, this red means it went backwards to intention, and his overall z-score was negative 2.1. Uh, it was a much larger number of trials. The net effect is that, you know, this is an anecdote, but the net effect is his overall database ended up just about where it started, and that's it. So I'm out of time. I'm going to stop here. Um, I tried to pace myself, didn't do a great job, but thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, and this point real quick, just so you know. The point is that your entire database could be comprised of these small, meaningful, purpose-driven effects, and that that's going to need to be pulled out somehow later. John, this is a great idea. Uh, it, you should be applauded for this. It's absolutely wonderful. I'd like to see your hardware in every high school in the country. Um, <laughs> what's your price point for your hardware? Right now, uh, we have what's called the Light Edition, and that uses, um, you, basically it has less researcher-oriented analysis capabilities, and that's, I think we have it at 245 right now, and the higher end is 599, and that has additional shielding. Uh, go through some more calibration, and there are more advanced features that researchers would want to use. We, we hope, I mean, this gets bigger and we could produce more of them, it would drive the cost down, but not yet. We're not there yet. You know, I also want to compliment you, and it's thrilling to see young people being creative and going beyond where their, their professors and teachers have taken them. Um, I had the privilege of working with a student at the University of Arizona, his name is Lonnie Nelson, who now has his PhD. And for his master's degree, he did a single subject experiment, um, a total of five experiments, which he actually got approved through his master's committee, ultimately published in um, JSE on individual, his own consciousness, which he tracked on a moment-to-moment -moment basis and how it related to the RG and did a whole series of experiments. And what his personal observation was is exactly what you've reported, which is the spontaneous capability for making discoveries and also for having enthusiasm and also the whole issue of humility versus arrogance and all these factors. And the only way those discoveries are ever going to be made is if people have access to this technology in an interesting fashion. And you're making that possible. So I just also want to personally thank you and hope this gets to, to not just lots of high schools, but hopefully to private homes and, and so on. Thank you. Um, and as a quick note on that, I, I didn't get to it in, in the presentation, but we actually have started coming up with new terms. They're not really new terms, but for example, my partner uses the word micropsychology. Basically, this idea that on a very small moment-to-moment -moment basis, there are fluctuations within an operator's, let's say, consciousness that manifest itself on the REG. And if we kind of use experimental methods that are too blunt, uh, we'll never, that would never shake out of the data. So we're really working on figuring that out. John, I've got one suggestion for you. Change your last name to Gates. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to give you back 45 seconds or something and, let you, and invite you to tell us all the most exciting, you know, s sloppy little study you ever did so that we can get what fun it was for you. That's tough. Um, See, the, the, that's the thing with the enthusiasm in the experiments. It, it's almost a, a contradiction with the idea of replicability in the first place. So what happens is something will spontaneously emerge that leads us to conducting experiments. Or, for example, I was sort of having that argument with the operator. Well, it's gone the other way before, where um, someone has said to me, oh, well, you know, the effect sizes can't be that large. Everybody's z-scores are such and such. So one time for a while, I conducted experiments where I would only generate a bit or two and then I would go away and I'd try to completely forget about it and then I would come back and I'd generate another bit or two, et cetera. And the point was that at the end of the day over maybe it was 100 or 150 or something trials, these painstakingly difficult to generate bits, we had a result that was extraordinarily statistically significant. But the point there was I was saying, look, my hit rate's like 80%. So it and I was trying to prove the point that it doesn't make any sense to talk about... Um, you know, to talk about things in terms of, well, what is the bit per bit effect size, et cetera. So I think there are situations where, at least within our own inner group, people kind of challenge one another scientifically, and then we get, like, enthusiastic about it. And we, we want to make a point, but it's not that serious. It's all in fun, and uh, neat stuff comes out of it. Last question. Minor, it's wonderful. Uh, beautiful presentation. Um, I love your spontaneity. <laughs> But I'm asking a minor question. Did you think of uh, carrying this uh, experiment in terms of the times of day? Is there any control by certain times of the hour? We do or have the that. 24 hours, would you see some major variation or major changes? 
I have never seen anything like that, but we do track things like, we do tra have time information in all of our data so we could easily look at it. We try to track almost as much as we can so that after the fact, if we really wanted to, we can go back over it and uh, look for such things. Thank you, John, for substance and enthusiasm. Thanks.